your, turn your Bible to Psalm 33, and we'll continue with the theme of the goodness and the greatness of our God. He has done great things. And this morning we sung, we feast in the, the house of Zion because he has done great things for us. And thank you, Vera, for the scripture reading. Last week we saw Psalm 22. It was about God's forgiveness and the joy of, God, of God's forgiveness so should drive us to confess our sins. And this morning we'll go through Psalm 33. If I were to ask you, are you thankful? Why are you thankful? If you are thankful, why are you thankful? You'd probably say, for God's blessings. And that's great. You are thankful for God's blessings. So many people are thankful, but sometimes it's, it's temporary. Some only on Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving is coming. They are thankful. But as Christians, follower of Christ, would you like to, to develop a thankful, worshiping heart? If yes, why are you thankful is so crucial because that will help you to grow a worshiping heart. And Psalm 33 gives us the answer to how to, to grow a thankful, a worshiping heart. And the Psalm was written to those addressed as the righteous ones and the upright in verse one. And that is it is written to those who know God personally and was seeking to, was, was seeking to please him by living obedient lives. But even these people need to exhort, be exhorted to sing for joy in the Lord, to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to him in verse two. And the Psalm tells us that if you want to grow a thankful, a worshiping heart, you need to rely completely on the Lord. So you see, I am thankful because I rely totally on the Lord. And we need to realize that genuine thankfulness is completely bound up with trust. We will never truly thank God until we first truly trust him. And we will not be grateful to God for all that we have until we recognize that we are dependent on him for all that we have. By nature, we are not trusting creatures. We are creatures of necessity. We trust God when we force to trust him because our problems go beyond our abilities. And the rest of the time, we get along just fine by ourselves. So if we can't solve the problem by ourselves, we don't resort to prayer and trusting God. Because we don't need to trust him. But it's only when we come to the end of ourselves and cast ourselves in total dependence of, on the Lord that we begin to experience genuine praise and thanksgiving. We don't know who wrote this psalm, but the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, attributes this psalm to David. It may have been written after, the, after Israel experienced a victory over an enemy. And I also believe that, I also believe it was David who wrote this psalm because David was a man of praise and thanksgiving. And the Lord had put him in many, many situations where everything was knocked out from under him, forcing him to trust in God alone for deliverance. So when God did deliver him, he was flooded with thankfulness and praise. Now let's jump into the Psalm, Psalm 33. You'll find it on page 549. 
five, four, nine. And the psalm begins with an exuberant call to praise God in song with musical instruments. You see that then um, uh, the psalm gives the reason to praise in verses four and five because of the greatness of his character, his word, and his work. And by the way, you have the bulletin insert. You can follow with me with the bulletin insert. And then verses 6 to 12 talk about the theme of God's word as seen in his creation and his counsel in, verse 10, in verses 10 to 12. And then we have verses 13 to 12 to 22. They speak of the other theme of God's, of how God works. He does not work through men's strength or schemes, but rather through those who fear and trust him. And the psalm concludes with a fervent expression of confidence and a profound and thoughtful prayer in verse 22. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So if we say that to be thankful is to rely on the Lord, then how do we rely completely on the Lord? We have the answer in the two main sections of the psalm. And first, the first one, we learn to rely completely on the Lord by recognizing the power of his word. You have it in verses 6 to 12. And then by recognizing the pattern of his working, verses 13 to 22. In other words, how God works. And therefore, this complete trust in the Lord will result in a thankful, worshiping heart. Let's go with me. First, we will start with verses 6 to 12. And the psalm is referring primarily to God's spoken word. So it applies it no less to his written word. When the psalm say, uh, he said the power of his word in verse 6, you see, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, the star host by the breath of his mouth. One commentator points out to that the psalm brings before us God's creation. Remember in Genesis chapter one, and you see the greatness of our God in, crea in the creation. And the, the commentator says, the psalmist brings before us God's creation of the world, because until we believe that he created all that is, we won't believe that the world is controlled by his wisdom and power. In other words, believing that God created the world also leads us to the truth of his providence in ruling the world, which the psalmist mentions in verses 10 to 12. And this relates directly to our believing that he controls the circumstances of our lives. If we believe that he creates the world, so that means he controls everything in our lives. Then he works everything together for the good for us according to his purpose. So to have a thankful, worshiping heart, we must bow in awe before the Lord as we realize his immense power in speaking the universe into existence. And the immensity of the universe is staggering. And there are billions of huge galaxies like our Milky Way. And truly, and with David, we can exclaim, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? God didn't have to struggle or, and to strain to create the universe. Rather, he did it by his basic word. As Genesis 1 records eight times, God said, let there be. 
and it happened. And as our psalm puts it, Psalm 33, he spoke and it was done. He commanded and he stood fast. And creation is a miracle of God's power. He created everything out of nothing by his word alone. As with all miracles, you cannot prove it. You must accept it by faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3 states, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that it was, what it was written, what it was seen, was not made out of things that are visible. In the Hebrews chapter 11. But the, on, the only alternative is that nothing produced everything. Or the matter has, all, has, always, has always existed. But in some miraculous manner, by complete chance alone, it came to have the intricately ordered form that we now observe. So now tell me which view takes more faith. You have a powerful God who said in his word that let it be and it happened. And the psalmist then goes, he goes on to consider the oceans in verse seven. If you look at in verse seven, you see in verse seven, it's God, it's like God gathers the waters of the sea into drawers. He puts the deep into the storehouses. The only ocean that the psalmist may have seen would have been the Mediterranean Sea. And perhaps the Red Sea at the Gulf of Aqaba. You would not have known that the world's oceans cover two-thirds of the, of the Earth's surface. The Pacific Ocean only covers almost 64 million square miles at an average of depth of, 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 over, of over 14 feet, with its greatest depth almost 36 feet. So if you have, if you have ever, ever seen, flown, or uh, the, the, this, the, the Pacific Ocean, but you know that is huge. So the psalmist pictures God as piling the water together as a farmer would pile a heap of grain in a barn. And this could be a reference that God stacking up the waters of the Red Sea when he brought Israel safely through. Or it may be a poetic description of God keeping the mighty oceans within the boundaries. See, in verse 7, the psalmist continues to say, you know, uh, he keeps, God keeps the, the oceans into boundaries. But either way, when you consider the grandeur of the heavens and the oceans, the conclusion is, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and he stood fast. And there is no way to harmonize or reconcile this text with the view that the universe and life, and on, and life on earth came about by random chance over billions of years. No chance, no, uh, no argument. It's clear that the psalmist gave us very um, thoughtful insight about God's creation. And there is no room for the view that God guided the process of evolution over billions of years. And rather, God spoke and it was done instantly. And the obvious application is that we should fall on our faces before such a powerful creator. And who are we to boast ourselves in pride against him? The Apostle Paul applies the doctrine of creation to our salvation. And after saying in 2 Corinthians 4, and after saying that Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He adds, 
For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the, of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, it was not your doing. You were in complete spiritual darkness. Furthermore, you loved it. And just as he spoke the sun into existence, even so God spoke light into your dark heart. Exactly what Paul said. And you may be thinking, but didn't I, didn't I have to choose to believe in Christ? Yes, of course you did. But the question is, how were you able to choose to believe in Christ? And the Bible is clear. If you have believed in Christ as Savior and Lord, it is because God first opened your blind eyes to see. And that is the only doctrine of salvation that causes us to humble ourselves in awe before the Creator. It's not your strength. It's not your ability to, to research about faith. It's only because Christ has opened your eyes to see. And in response to that, you humble yourselves before the Creator. The human race is prone to pride. We bend ourselves to get in nations and assemble powerful armies to conquer kingdoms and control our destiny. But the psalmist goes on to show, in verse 10, the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He opposes it or he frustrates the plans of the nations. The counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart from generation to generation. And blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. You can contrast these words with the proud words of poet William Ernest Henley. He says, I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. And God says, no, you are not. I am the boss. I am the creator. And our Lord and God does not change. He changes not his purpose. His decree is not frustrated. His purposes are always accomplished. God has a predestination according to his counsel, to the counsel of his will. And none of the devices of his enemies can oppose his decree for a moment. No one. And you will see what the psalmist will say later. And how, we com how the psalmist compares God who knows everything to us who is very little. We are very, very little. You'll see in the coming verses. And God's power to accomplish his purposes is no way diminished by the passing of the years. No way. He who was absolute over Pharaoh in Egypt is no less today king of kings and lord of lords. The wheels of his chariot still roll in imperial grandeur, none being able for a moment to resist his eternal will. No one who can be against our Lord. And proud men think that they, you know, proud men, they think, um, proud men think that he, do, he directs the course of history. But the Bible is clear that God sets up and takes down the most powerful kings in history for his own sovereign purposes. And whether it was Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, or Cyrus, God used them to further his purposes for his chosen people. Of course, none of those guys, none of those men knew God or were seeking to follow God. And they were making decisions that they thought would further their own agendas. But behind the scenes, God providentially used their decisions to further his 
agenda. And they were responsible for their decisions. And they will answer to God for those decisions. And yet God used those decisions to implement his own counsel and plans. And we see this plainly illustrated in the most important event in history, in human history, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this was Satan's plan and proud man's most serious attempt to cast off God's rule. You see, you remember in John chapter, in John, in Acts 4, in the book of John, uh, in, in exactly uh, the, in the book of Acts, the early church prays, uh, they, they say, for truly in the city they were gathered together against the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And these self-centered, proud rulers who were responsible for crucifying, crucifying the Lord's anointed one. And yet, in so doing, they inadvertently carried out God's eternal plan of redemption. God canceled and frustrated, and frustrated their plans and established his plan. And the power of God's word as seen in his counsel is further stated in verse 12. And the psalmist says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. And this refers to Israel, whom God chose as distinct from all other peoples to be his people in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Although they were, you know, uh, disobedient, and rebellious, God used them to bring the Savior into the world. As I understand uh, Romans chapter 11, although God has set them aside for these for past 20 centuries because they crucified the Savior, he will yet graciously bring a widespread revival among the Jews to the praise of the glory of his grace. And meanwhile, we as the church, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of, for God's own possession. The reason that any of us are part of God's people is his sovereign choice of us. And you need to rejoice on that because you are part of God's family. It's a blessing that God has chosen you, not yesterday, not two months ago, but before the foundation of the world. So the point of verses 6 to 12 is that we will learn to rely completely on the Lord when we see the power of his word as seen in his creation and his counsel of his sovereign plan. And because his word stands against all opposition, we can confidently rely on him. But also, we learn to rely on him by recognizing the pattern of his working. In verse four, the psalmist says that we should thank and praise the Lord for his word, but also because all his work is done in faithfulness. So after the Psalms develops the theme of God's word in verses six to 12, he now shows that God does not work through men's schemes or strength, but rather those who fear and trust in him. And therefore we trust and hope in him. The Lord looks from heaven, he sees all the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out all the people of the earth, he who forms the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works, is exactly what the psalmist is saying. And he says, the king is not saved by a mighty army, a warrior is not delivered by great strength, a horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by his great strength. 
So this, uh, you know, the psalmist pictures God as looking down from heaven as you and I might look down from a tall building on, on, on people below. We never experience when you go to, you know, a, a tower, you see people very, very little. Exactly what, how God sees us. And God sees everyone on, on earth. He sees the woman bent over her rice paddy in Thailand. He sees people hunting for food in the jungles of South America. He sees the executive at his desk on the 24th or 34th building in downtown Montreal. He sees us sitting here. But more than seeing everyone, God knows what they are thinking in their hearts. That's very interesting. He made every heart and he understands not only what we do, but also why we do it. Very interesting. God knows our hearts. And there is a king going out to battle with what to him is a mighty army. Is he trusting in, the, in that army for victory? God knows. There is a soldier, his muscles rippling with strength mounted on his impressive horse. Is he trusting in his own strength or in the strength of his horse? God knows. He considers everything they do. Not in vain that does God see men's acts? A very interesting thing. He ponders and judges them. He sees them. He sees the reasons that why we do things. And he reads the secret design, the outward behavior, and he resolves the apparent good into its real elements. Beloved friends, consider your ways, for God considers them. The fact is, our human tendency, even as redeemed people, is to perfect our methods and then trust in them. We live in a day that is flooded in methods and techniques for how to live the Christian life, or how to have a happy family, or how to build a successful church. Or we have different books on those subjects. But of course, many of these methods are helpful because they are based on scripture. But granted, God's normal way of working is not through faith plus nothing, but rather through faith plus using certain methods or means to accomplish his will. But the ever-present danger is that we plug in the methods and trust in them to work instead of using the methods while we trust in God to work. The psalmist is saying that God does not work through men's, men's strength or schemes, but because the man gets the glory. God does work through those who fear and trust in him. And the psalmist just said that the Lord sees everyone on earth. In verse 18, he states now that the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. And what does he mean? He means that God looks with favor on those who fear him and trust in him. To deliver to them from overwhelming situations. In other words, God's means of working is not to find people with well-organized methods and bless them, but rather to find people who trust in him and bless them. It's a very important principle. And note that these people are described as strong and self-sufficient. In fact, they are in grave danger, grave difficulty. They are facing death and famine. And people who learn to be thankful must rely on the Lord, must first learn to trust in God. 
and people who learn to trust in God must at some point be deprived of all human support so that they can turn to God alone for deliverance. And as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves with that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Judge Miller said, it is very time, it is the very time for faith to work when sight ceases. And the greater the difficulties, the easier for faith. As long as, as, long as there remain certain natural prospects, faith doesn't get on even as easily. As when all natural prospects fail, God starts working. Hudson Taylor said, you have proved the sufficiency of God only when you have trusted in, the trust in him for the impossible. Let me tell you friends, God works through helpless people who trust in him. Those who fear God need not fear anything else and let them fix their eye of faith on him for his eyes of love will always rest upon them. Let me conclude with the last part of the psalm. Therefore we trust and hope in God. You have in verses 18 to 22, those verses are filled with synonyms for trust in the Lord. You have fear, hope, weights, our health and our shield. Our heart rejoices in him and we trust in his holy name, which means his holy character. And the Psalms, which emphasize praise and thanksgiving, also emphasize trust. And the Hebrew word for trust appears more frequently in the Psalms than any other place in the, in the Bible. Again, it's not that methods are wrong, but rather than trusting in methods is wrong. And our trust must be in God alone. And what is the result of that? And go back to the, to the beginning of the psalm in verses 1 to 5. When we put our trust in God, when we put our complete trust in the Lord, that will result in a thankful, worshipping heart. And thankfulness and worship are bound up with trusting in the Lord. And when you have no human means of, of escape or, you know, you have no human support and you cry out to God as your, as your only hope, he delivers you and your heart overflows in thankfulness and praise to him. When a sleep method works, the method gets praise. When God works, he gets the praise. And the psalmist says, play skillfully. So it is sad to, you know, um, for people to praise God in a very uh, neglected manner, neglected way. God deserves the best we have. Every Christian should strive to sing according to the rules of heart. Uh, also, they can stay, the, so that they can stay on time and in tune with the congregation. And the sweetest tunes and the sweetest voices with sweetest words are too little for the Lord our God. And let us not offer him limping rhymes set to hushed tunes and rolled out by discordant voices. Let's praise his name with all that we have and with all that we have. You see in verses 1 to 3, it's rather it's you know, it's exuberant praise that the psalmist calls. Sing for joy in the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song, one that celebrates some new deliverance of victory. Play skill skillfully with a shout of joy. And you get the impression that he should be pleased with, he should not, you know, that he, should, he would be pleased with folks reading their bulletins or sitting stoically through the singing. The psalmist could not be pleased by that. And Calvin describes this as 
the vehement and ardent affection with the faithful are to have to praise God. You may protest that your personality is too reserved to get excited about worship, but we are all get excited about that in which we delight. If you're, if you're watching a soccer, a soccer game, a football game, a hockey game, let me, tell, let me say a football game, and your team makes a spectacular catch in the, in, in the end zone, do you sit there stoically eating potato chips? You probably get excited and, uh, you know, you, you, you see that and you, you would probably fling the, the bowl of chips in the air. You know, I got it! And your team won. Why? Because you delight in football. You delight in hockey. You delight in soccer. But the secret to helpful heartful praise and thanksgiving is you know sh shout out to joy to the lord that show him that you're excited about worship when you go on sunday morning lord i really want to give you my heart the best that i have you could not save yourself from god's right to judgment you cried to the, to the god who spoke the universe into existence the god you sent who sent his son to save you by his grace because now you have experienced his great love and grace you delight in him and his great salvation and you cannot help but sing for joy as god's righteous ones let's lean hard on him to work through us for his glory when we see him deliver us deliver our souls from death and keep us alive in famine our response will be to sing and praise him exuberantly with thankful hearts. Friends, let me encourage you, focus not on the gift, but on the giver. And such hope will never, never disappoint us. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and thank you for your greatness, your goodness, your mercy, your loving kindness. We pray, Lord, that you will Help us remember that you are great and you are still, you're still working in our lives. Let us trust in you, put our trust in you as you work through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to your, let's turn your hymn book to number 347. 347. 347. And can it be? Let's all rise. <laughs>